standing up of who you are. You have overwhelmed my heart once again. My all in all, my everything. With abandon, I have come to meet you here. Be I've seen your majesty filled with wonder now my soul must sing be exalted to go. All right, everybody, come on in here if you're not already, and let's stand up and worship the Lord.
thousand times I've failed Still your mercy remains And should I stumble again Still I'm caught in your grace Everlasting Your light will shine when all else fades Never ending Your glory goes beyond all
world is searching for that in every place, and they can't find it, Lord, and you're right there. Lord, we just, uh, we just thank you so much for giving us that anytime, anywhere. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and greet each other.
your love that does it. Lord, that's what changes us. Lord, we just thank you so much for your love and everything you've given us and promised us to come, Lord. Please open up your word to us now that we would just abide in you until um, you come for us, Lord. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. We are in Exodus chapter 4 tonight. We go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through the Old Testament, Wednesday night. Sundays we're going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through the New Testament. We are in Revelation, our second time through the New Testament. And we'll start back at Matthew. And Friday we have service, and we're studying books of prophecy. So I want to be here for that. This Friday I'll be up in Appleton at a stake and study, it's called, a men's get-together that uh, they asked me to teach at. So there's information if that's something you want to go to. Otherwise, there will be service here. We are chartering a bus the 26th down to Rock Island. So um, if you want to get on board for that, there is a sign-up sheet in the back, and uh, it's free. We just jump on, we go down to Church of uh, African Refugees, brothers and sisters in the Lord that we've been able to just come alongside of and be part of what they're doing there. We're real blessed to be part of that. So the 26th, we will be doing that. It'll be an early day and a little later, so uh, just check with Brian or I if you want to do that. But put your name on the list so we can make sure that you get a spot on the bus. 
throughout the week. Uh, there's Bible studies, uh, Friday morning women's Bible study, Saturday morning men's Bible study. Um, Tuesday morning, there is mom's group. So if your mom with uh, kids, you bring your kids and the moms have prayer time and Bible study out in front. The kids are watched by uh, some older moms back in here. And Monday night, there's a mom's group. So all of that is on the calendar. Pray for our uh, young adults who are in Austria right now doing mission trip. They just got to Klagenfurt today. There's 23 of them there. Um, doing uh, ministry for a retreat in Austria, a real, you know, hard mission field, but, you know, they're working hard, you know, it's really beautiful, actually, and so uh, getting a lot of training in ministry, so uh, keep them in prayer. Lord, we do pray for our brothers and sisters who are overseas right now and ask that you would be with them and uh, keep them safe while they travel around. Use them mightily, Lord, especially the younger ones, God, this might be their first mission trip. I pray that they would come back uh, energized, built up, strengthened, Lord, that their walk with you would be stronger. God, please feed us from your word tonight, Lord. I pray your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and our instructor. Lord, awesome things here. We ask you to speak to us through the book of Exodus. In Jesus' name, amen. Exodus 4, then Moses answered and said, but suppose... They will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground. It became a serpent and Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand, take it by the tail. He reached out his hand, caught it, became a rod in his hand that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Now we're dropping into the middle of this extended narrative of Moses' first meeting with God at the burning bush, where God calls him to be the deliverer of his people. The children of Israel had been in Egypt for over 400 years by that time, having arrived as the close relatives. And you think of this, when they got there, they were all the relatives of Joseph. Joseph was a national hero. He had just saved everybody's lives in the whole, you know, mid Middle East. And he was running the Egyptian empire second only to Pharaoh. And so his family, they show up, they're welcomed with open arms. They're given the best part of the land for agriculture and life was great for the children of Israel for several generations. Now, one thing historically that's not brought out in the biblical text is that at the time of Joseph, Egypt's rulers, including Pharaoh, were of Semitic descent, the Hissaks, though who had invaded and had taken over that area of Asian and Middle Eastern, you know, descendancy. They were more populous people in Egypt, the, the Noah's son Shem, his descendants which made things a lot easier because that's what the Jews are. They're Semitic. But that changed during this 400 years in Egypt. The rulers, including Pharaoh, much of the population had been taken over by descendants of Noah's son Ham, who were more African than Middle Eastern. That's something that took place historically. There was wars, totally different ethnicity. So several wars between these two groups of people, the Shemites, the Hamites, over the control of Egypt. Here at the time of Moses, it was the descendants of Ham who were in control. And they didn't appreciate this large nation of Semitic Jews living and thriving amongst them, which to a large extent brought about the attempt at ethnic cleansing, the killing of their male babies, throwing them in the river. You see that in the opening chapters, like the first Holocaust. The book opened with God's providential work in preparing the deliverer, one of their own, Moses, spending his first 40 years of his life trained in Pharaoh's court as a prince in the palace. But at 40 years old, Moses rejected palatial living, sensed a call to go deliver his fellow Shemites. They had been beaten down into slavery by this time. And Moses arrives on the scene there at 40 years old. In his mind, he's going to be the hero only to fail miserably. 
not only not delivering the people, but having to flee for his own life. It's a big dramatic escape scene. He just gets away and then it all fades to black. And now here in chapters three and four, it's like the music comes back up, the scene of this gray haired old man. He's out by himself in a desert with a flock of sheep. And the words come on the screen, you know, 40 years later. Here he is, gray hair Moses, just this humble nobody and seems to be loving it. And he's confronted by an appearance of God's Shekinah glory in the burning bush. The sense of calling that he had experienced 40 years earlier but had dismissed, and probably a midlife crisis or something, the reality of that is confirmed with this, with his preparation is now complete. Before, he didn't need God. In his mind, everything was, you know, was ready to go. Everything was done in his flesh, in his own power, and was a complete disaster as it normally is when I try to do things in my flesh. Now, 40 years later, Moses is convinced that he is not the man for the job. He's convinced that he can't do it, and God doesn't need him. And so he's ready. Now he's ready to go. Because he's never been able to deliver the people. And God doesn't need him. God doesn't need anybody. It's just taken him 80 years, some amazing turn of events, to come to realize this. Realize he's not the deliverer of the children of Israel. God is. So Moses questioned God regarding his choice of him for this task back in chapter 3, verse 11, where it said, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God answered Moses' doubts the same way he answers mine. He tells me in advance how it's going to happen. It says there in verse 16, You go and you gather the elders of Israel, chapter 3, verse 16, you gather all the Israels, you tell them, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you, seen what is done to you in Egypt. Tell them that I have said, I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, land flowing with milk and honey. Then they will heed your voice, and you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us. And now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. I'm sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not even by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand, God tells him. I will strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. It shall be when they go, you shall not go empty-handed. Every woman will ask of her neighbor, namely of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, gold, clothing. Put them on your sons, on your daughters, and you will plunder the Egyptians. And so here we see that Moses is told right up front, this is what's going to happen. Thankfully, Scripture is not impartial even in its heroes. Abraham's unbelief is recorded. David's sin is laid out for everyone to see, Peter's denial, and here Moses. Even after receiving God's word in advance of how everything is exactly going to play out from God personally, in verse 1 of chapter 4, Moses just totally contradicts all that the Lord had just told him. Literally and emphatically, his word in verse 1 is, they won't believe me. They won't listen to me. They'll say the Lord has not appeared to you. And the English words suppose that are there in verse 1 are added by translators to try and soften Moses' contradiction. Now, it is going to happen exactly as the Lord described it there in chapter 3. And we'll see that in subsequent chapters. And actually, as I pointed out last time, what God reveals to Moses here is simply an expanded version of what he revealed to Abraham close to five centuries earlier in Genesis 15. God had told Abraham, know certainly your descendants 
will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, will serve them, they will afflict them 400 years, and the nation whom they serve I will judge, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions, Genesis 15 verses 13 and 14. So God had told the five centuries earlier, had told him what was going to happen. God's just reconfirming his word that is, is going to happen. And Moses denies it. It gives me great hope because you see Moses lacked faith and Moses failed. As I read the Bible, I begin to see God sure uses a lot of failures. You know, there's a lot of people, they think they know everything. They think they'll just sit there and I'll listen and I'll go, yeah, I'll judge who this person is. But see, you know, they got nothing. You read the Bible, God uses failures. In fact, that's all he uses because that's all he's got to work with, broken, fallen human beings. You study God's faithfulness in the light of human unbelief and disobedience here in his word. That is what, how God is going to use me to spare me. I'm, I'm to study these passages and realize, you know, God can use me as well. And it can spare me from having to suffer the same mistakes. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If Moses would have lived the perfect life of obedience, then the, listen, the lesson would have been, I got to be like Moses, obviously. And my eyes and my focus would be on him, trying to be like him. But through the way this is written, for my instruction, the lesson is more, don't be like Moses. I have to trust God and keep my eyes on God. It's interesting in the way that as Scripture unfolds, it's not just a series of historical events, but in how God's perfect plan unfolds in spite of people, I see how he works through failure a very valuable teaching tool spiritually. Now, I don't know if he was a believer. The founder of IBM, his name was Tom Watson, built his company on allowing people to learn from their mistakes. One young executive, he lost the company $10 million through a foolish blunder. He took a risk, lost him $10 million. He was called into Tom Watson's office, and he said, I suppose you want me to tender my resignation. Watson said, you got to be kidding. We just spent $10 million educating you. So that's how God he invests a lot in failure so as to instruct humanity in his ways. God's answer to Moses is failure, his failure to obey. His answer to Moses' is objection comes in the form of three signs. This first one with the rod <clears throat> says, so the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a rod cast it on the ground, so he cast it on the ground and became a serpent. So God doesn't use some elaborate, handcrafted, you know, golden plates like the Mormons had or beautiful jewel-encrusted icon like Catholics or some crystal ball. What, what's in your hand? It's a stick. That's what this rod was, a walking stick. It doubles as a shepherd's staff. The man-made religion has to construct flashy, very flamboyant buildings and material objects that impress, draw people on an earthly level because that's all they have. God delights in using ordinary and making that extraordinary. So all attention goes where it belongs to him. Throw that stick on the ground. Mo just does. It turns into some kind of snake. It's frightening enough to cause Moses to run away from it. So not some little garter snake, but probably some kind of poisonous serpent. It's on the news Monday at the TSA security in Miami airport. They found a bag of snakes in somebody's pants. They're trying to smuggle them onto the airplane. It wasn't, it wasn't that kind of serpent. Whatever this was, it freaked them out. But he tells them, reach out your hand and take it by the tail showing the need to, for faith on Moses' part. If you've ever played with snakes, messed around with them, not rattlesnakes, but, you know, little grass snakes or something, you don't grab them by the tail. They can reach around and bite you. You grab them right behind the head. So there's an element of trust. You grab it by the tail, which he does. And as he does, God says the, the, the snake turns back into a walking stick. 
And God says to him there, that will be done to convince the people, verse 5, that the God of their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, had indeed appeared to Moses. Furthermore, verse 6, the Lord said to him, Now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, Put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out of his bosom. Behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Then it will be if they do not believe you nor heed the message of the first sign that they may believe the message of the latter sign. So the first sign causes one type of fear, the fear of something outside of himself. The first sign with the snake allowed that fear to be overcome by trusting God's power. The second sign would produce a different fear, more personal. He can't run away from this. But it too is overcome by the power of God and would eliminate the fear. These are meant to be signs, verse 8, in the sense of a signal or a warning. The word message is literally voice in the King James a miraculous occurrence through which God is speaking. Now, it's interesting that the message that he's saying through these miracles is not given. Now, he doesn't say, you know, nor heed this message. What is the message? He's just supposed to give the sign. So it's interesting. He doesn't say what the message is. But he says, if they don't believe the voice of the first miracle, then they will believe the voice of the second one. What it is that these miracles were meant to achieve appears to be threefold from the context here. He, it's evidently meant to first strengthen Moses' faith so he will go forward. Secondly, to authenticate his authority when he appears before the children of Israel. And then thirdly, we'll see, it's to show forth God's superiority over Mo, Pharaoh and his magicians. Verse 9, and it shall be if they do not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice that you shall take water from the river, pour it out on the dry land. The water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. The first sign would serve to convince any who were reasonable, already predisposed to follow God. Okay, a stick turns into a snake. I'll listen. The second sign would warn it awakened those who were hardened in their unbelief. Oh, turning into a snake, dude, it must be some trick, you know, I, I don't believe it. Well, okay, how about if you get afflicted with a terminal, incurable, flesh-eating disease? Now, that causes people, it's amazing how many people care less about the things of God until they are personally afflicted. I've been a pastor 27 years. Believe me, people show up. You know, they're all proud and they know everything, dude, until the Lord afflicts them with something. Now, all of a sudden, they're humbled. You know, now they're forced to deal with their own mortality. It's like, hey, can you tell me about God again, dude? I'm ready to listen. This third sign would awaken this idolatrous nation of Egypt and their leaders to the strength and the power of the God that Moses represents. They would display God's ability to change what was the lifeblood of their nation, the Nile River. Dude, this is where all of their agriculture, everything came from the Nile. God could turn it into literal blood. The Nile River was worshipped by the superstitious Egyptians. For Moses to show that the God he served could turn the water of the Nile into blood, like watch this, pours it out, that would render their, them helpless. Their God would be rendered to be subjected to who Moses represented, taking the water, pouring it on dry land. It turns into blood. That's declaring the ability of the God of Moses. He could turn all of this water to blood if he chose. Such a sign would force people, depending upon the Nile for their existence, it would force them to listen theoretically. Verse 10, it says, Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. 
So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth, or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? Yeah, I worked with folks with developmental disabilities for years in home care, people who were born you know, with blindness or hearing or some kind of deficiency. And I worked with them, and especially after I got saved, I'd think, you know, what went wrong? Did why, you know, why would God allow this to happen to this person? And I read this verse, and I realize God doesn't make mistakes. You know, in John's Gospel, chapter 9, Jesus and his disciples are passing by a man blind from birth. His disciples ask, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus said, neither, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. So God takes full responsibility for creating people physically the way that they are. There's some purpose. It may not be readily apparent this side of heaven, but God has a purpose. And having worked with people with disabilities, I can tell you they've got great purpose. Now, if I smoke a carton of cigarettes a week, I can't say, why did God give me cancer? You know, <laughs> it's kind of self-inflicted. If I drink a lot of alcohol, I destroy my liver, that's my fault. Every person is born imperfect in some way. We live in a fallen world. God in his mercy, it seems, he will give some people certain physical problems to strengthen them in other areas. Anything that can be accomplished by human effort alone, anything that is accomplished by human effort is worthless to God. Complete dependence upon God, that is what is most valuable in eternity. If Moses had been an eloquent orator, if he, you know, he, he may have been able to rally a crowd around himself, but he never could have delivered the whole nation without the divine aid. You know, as a little kid, I couldn't talk. I couldn't talk right in, and no one could understand what I was saying except my mom. I started school, I would have to be taken out of class and go to speech therapist every week. It's very humiliating for a little kid. <laughs> This lady would put these sticks in my mouth and retrain my speech. It caused me to work very hard just to communicate. Thought, I mean, who would think, you know, I'd be teaching God's word one day? Who would know it? The idea in verse 11 is that God could have cured Moses. No problem. He could have cured him. He only formed every cell in Moses' body. And in verse 12, the indication is that God would have cured him if he had only submitted. Now, therefore, verse 12, go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you will say. But he said, oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. Moses just says, send somebody else. I don't want to do it. He's taking a contrary stance against God's will. To which verse 14 says, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. It's not that God flies off the handle. You know, the language is used to be understandable to us. God was, God was not happy. His anger is not expressed in some fit of rage, you know, like he smacks Moses upside the head. Only good and perfect gifts come down from the God of heaven, James says. What is shown here is how God's anger is expressed in simply withholding blessings. Fine, and he withholds blessings, blessings that he was desirous, blessings he was ready to give to Moses, but which Moses refused to receive. So the anger of the Lord, verse 14, was kindled against Moses. And he said, is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he is coming, also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall say to him, and put the words in his mouth, that I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. And you shall take this rod in your hand, with which you shall do the signs. Now the designation here, in verse 14 
of Aaron the Levite there. It's establishing a matter of significance that would only become evident in the future. Moses, too, was a Levite, but God would use Aaron to do the speaking. Moses was just go along and be the intermediary between God and everyone else. Now, at this point, Moses had no clue as to what the future held for the children of Israel, whom he was going to deliver. God did. God knew that the Levites were going to become the priestly tribe. That was to become the distinguishing honor of that tribe. Moses had no clue of this. God did. The head of the house of Levi would be especially honored, the high priest. And we'll see that as we go along, as Moses will also see what could have been a perpetual blessing for Moses and his household, the high priesthood is forfeited to Aaron and his household. As it says centuries later, 1 Chronicles 23, 13, and Aaron was separated that he should sanctify the most holy things, he and his sons, forever. Now, this could have been Moses. Moses said, just get somebody else. Aaron was separated to sanctify the most holy things forever, to burn incense before the Lord and to minister unto him and to bless his name forever. Moses didn't know anything about the establishment of a privileged priesthood of whom his descendants could have been the heirs of that. And he should have figured, I suppose, and God appeared to him. But see, Moses himself will have to record this. Moses wrote this. He would have to record this classic blunder of faith, seeing he's the author. This is right up there with Esau rejecting his birthright, King Saul, you know, rejecting the, the dynasty. So many others you see in Scripture. This also then should be very instructive for me. As I said before, it isn't just recorded for historical narrative, but as a spiritual instruction. I'm reading this. Okay, what am I learning from this? God is sovereign. He's going to use Moses. He even laid out his whole plan to him in advance there in chapter 3, how he's, how he's going to use him. But God is not sovereign over robots. That's not true sovereignty. God is sovereign over free moral agents. He could have created Moses perfect, could have made him obedient and avoided all of this. It seems, you know, that would be a lot more practical, dude. That would be a lot more efficient, would have expedited things a lot quicker and smoother. Just make Moses do this. But that's not God's primary purpose. That's what we learn. God is preparing an eternal kingdom. And he's redeeming fallen human beings for that. It's not just redeeming people for some earthly work. He's redeeming us so as to be granted entrance into his glorious presence in a relationship that is higher than angels, ultimately, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 says. And so the Holy Spirit inspired this passage of Scripture as he has so many others to show another aspect in how God works through this redeeming process as instruction in righteousness, the New Testament calls it, unto eternal goal. This is teaching all who care to know that those who decline God's service here on earth, who refuse to inconvenience my flesh, carnal nature, as God calls me to, prepares me for an eternal kingdom, if I refuse to inconvenience myself for God's will, I'm only forfeiting and foregoing divine blessings, which I can't even imagine from my present frame of reference. One day, maybe I'll be shown what those are. Moses was. Moses was shown by, you know, rejecting this. Okay, you know, I'm not going to force you to be the high priest. I'm sure if God would have said, here, Moses, let me transport you out to the time of temple worship and show you what Aaron's descendants are going to do. In fact, here, let me give you an advanced copy of Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48, and you see what awaits the high priestly line of Aaron in the millennial kingdom. 
the beautiful worship complex during the thousand-year reign of Christ with the sons of Zadok of Aaron's priestly line holding special honor, leading worship around the glorified Messiah. I'm sure then Moses said, well, let, let me rethink this a minute, okay? <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I'll take you up on this. But God doesn't give those insights to Moses because special privileges, eternal blessings await those who trust in God presently. I can't see it, but it doesn't seem to make sense. I'm under extreme pressure, hardship to do so or I can reject it. Free will is an essential factor in my relationship with God presently. These are strong lessons. They'll be shown even more important as this narrative unfolds. Here it says in verse 18, So Moses went, returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, said to him, Please let me go and return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. Now the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. So Moses returns to Jethro as a head of the family, and he receives permission to return to his brethren there in Egypt. See if they're still alive. Brethren is a Hebrew word. It speaks of direct relatives. So not just the Israelites as a whole, but his family. And Jethro is shown really throughout the pages of Scripture to be a very gracious man. It's very gracious here, allows Moses to leave in peace. Now, while back in Midian, verse 19, where Jethro was, it appears that Moses received a second visit from the Lord. The Lord says to him, Go return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. From the message here, it's evident that Moses was hesitating to leave out of fear. He's told, don't worry about it. Just go. They're not there. A message alleviates his fears. So God is continually working with him, showing himself to be more than patient with Moses. Then Moses took his wife, verse 20, and his sons, set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. Now, only one son had been mentioned back in chapter 2. Here, another son is implied. And the context reveals a newborn, as we'll see in verse 25. Literally, verse 20 says, He set them on the donkey while he walked, in other words. And he took the rod of God in his hand. So it's quite a, a scene portrayed here. Some reluctant guy, everything he owns, including his family, on one donkey... But he's got this stick, okay? This is what he's going to, Egypt, to conquer. It's no longer a shepherd's staff or a walking stick. It is something that symbolizes the source of the power of his mission. So God doesn't need much to accomplish his purposes. And it's like in this simple act of obedience, this little mustard seed of faith just stepping out. He's going to start walking more revelation is given. In verse 21, the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do all these wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you'll say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. So here, more insight as to what awaits is given to Moses, more details. And so I learned that obedience, you know, Moses just starting to walk step by step to Egypt. Obedience is a gateway to greater insight. One theologian put it, he said, understanding is a reward of faith. Therefore, seek not to understand so as to believe, but believe so as to understand. God will give me the understanding when I'm walking by faith. But see, that's hard. I want the understanding, and then I'll walk by faith. But that's not true faith. I have to step out when everything seems apparently the opposite direction. And yet God is leading me into this, so I'm walking in by faith. Now God gives me understanding as I'm going ahead. Moses is told in verse 21 to do all these wonders 
that he'll put in your hand, literally, implying more than just the three. So there's going to be more than these three. These were to be done before Pharaoh, but I will harden his heart, it says, so that he will not let the people go. There, verse 21. This is something that doesn't make sense at first. You know, you read this, you go, wait a minute, God's going to harden him so he doesn't let the people go. Why would he do that? Well, it's going to be revealed clearly in subsequent chapters in Pharaoh's, is Pharaoh's personal resistance. Pharaoh will first be seen to harden his own heart, and that will be shown in the text. He will harden his own heart in response to God's mercy being extended. But when men do not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gives them up to a reprobate mind, Romans 1.28 says. If people resist his Holy Spirit, he takes his Holy Spirit from them, Psalm 51.11. If they sin against the light, he withdraws the light from them, 2 Corinthians 3.14. God doesn't harden someone so that they will be lost. The fact of the matter is people are lost to begin with. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, Jesus said in John 3, 17. But that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him, Jesus said, is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. It's not like Pharaoh was this nice guy on his way to heaven when God comes along and hardens him so he goes to hell. Pharaoh, like everybody else, was already lost on his way to hell to begin with. God in his mercy will be shown to go to very ex extensive lengths to break him, to the, the miracles that are shown. He's trying to break him from his lostness, but Pharaoh will refuse God's gracious offer and God will harden him unto lostness not in you know not unto lostness but in his lostness when moses would meet with pharaoh he was to say to him thus says the lord verse 22 israel is my son my firstborn this type of introduction to say israel is my son my firstborn says the lord that would be recognized at once by Pharaoh because the Egyptian rulers of that time were all referred as the son of their god, the son of Ra, the sun god. So this would be something that would be, you know, completely understandable, something borne out in countless inscriptions discovered by archaeologists. So the language would be familiar as he introduces himself, but at the same time, God's declaration of Israel in this way sets them apart from all other nations, not only as the one nation with whom God has entered into a covenant relationship, but it presupposes endearment when God calls them his son. His chosen people are expressed by as a father expressing endearment for a son that he loves. It's one of numerous metaphors that are used in the Old Testament to describe God's relationship with Israel. He displays various aspects through these different relationships, how he relates to human beings as he relates to Israel. Israel, Israel is referred to as his wife in Jeremiah chapter 3 and the book of Hosea elsewhere in the Old Testament. Israel is referred to as his vineyard in passages like Isaiah chapter 5, others. They are his flock in Ezekiel 34. Other metaphors here, they are his adopted child with all the rights and privileges that that type of relationship carries with it. Israel is my son, my firstborn, Moses was to tell Pharaoh. And in verse 23, so I say to you, let my son go that he, he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Now, the verb here is a lot stronger in the original language. This was to be given as a command. It wasn't like, hey, could you please do this? He's commanded, let my son go. Israel was to be released from the bondage that they were held under in Egypt so as to worship God in the place that he had designed for that to take place. If Pharaoh refuses, God will kill his firstborn, verse 23 says. 
<laughs> now, if this were simply a matter of release, if this was simply, I just want to get the people out of there, you'd think God himself would appear. And God appeared in all his glory. Pharaoh would end up face first on the ground, and God would just march his people out of there. That would seem, you know, the most practical, you know, most expedient way again. But instead, he sends a reluctant shepherd who can't speak with a stick. There's obviously lessons I'm supposed to learn here, okay, as I'm reading this. As God brings down Pharaoh and delivers his people through cloaking his divine power in weakness. This is what God does. There's a lot of people who are very prideful. They got their nose in the air, dude, and they know everything. And they're going to sit in judgment of everybody, okay? God brings that down. And his divine power is shown in weakness and humility. These are things God uses to demonstrate his power so that the exodus is going to be even more glorious than if God had used no human instrument at all, the way he does this. Human weakness in service to God is able to display the magnitude of God's strength. In the same way, if a, person, uh, a person's strength would be displayed, if they carved Mount Rushmore with a toothpick, it wouldn't be the toothpick getting all the glory. They wouldn't be going, wow, dude, that must be some to No, they would look at the person, how could you do this? This is how God displays his power. As we're shown in Egypt, uh, you know, meant to, this is meant to encourage me in my weakness, my inabilities. That I'm not limited by that. We aren't limited by that. As a church body, it's amazing. God's given us church building to give to other people. He's given us multiple radio stations, given us, you know, just unlimited, you know, ability to get his word out without ever once having our hand out for an offering. Just looking to him and praying to him. But see, it takes great courage to not be limited by that. Great courage. God's greatest expressions of strength and power are displayed through the lowliest means here on earth. Just look at the cross. A wooden Roman cross, dude, how much power displayed there. Now this next passage we'll look at before we close really unusual, very difficult to understand. It says there in verse 24, It came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him, to Moses. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone, cut off the foreskin of her son, cast it at Moses' feet, and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. Then she said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. There's no details given. And so the only way to understand what transpires here, and more importantly, why, why does this happen? The only way to understand is to draw conclusions from what is given. After the whole encounter, the burning bush, it came to pass, verse 24 on the way, that the Lord met Moses and you know, sought to kill him. How he sought to kill him, it doesn't say. The verb sought doesn't mean he tried, but he failed. But it means the Lord required Moses' death and was in the process of taking his life, causing many to believe some sort of fatal illness overtook Moses at the encampment. Speaking of an area, encampments, where caravan would pull off the side of the, the travel route, like a camel version of a truck stop, why Moses' life came to re be required of him is surmised from what transpires in verses 25 and 26. It's assumed that it is because of Moses' failure to circumcise his second son, Eleazar. Eleazar could have possibly even been born on the way. This would have been about a month's journey. From the actions and words of Moses' wife, Zipporah, it appears that the neglect to circumcise their newborn son was because of her. Now, circumcision of a newborn born boy in the he, among the Hebrews on the eighth day was a sign of the descendants of Abraham's covenant relationship with God. 
If they were not circumcised, they were not allowed under the covenant, Abrahamic covenant. Zipporah's actions make it obvious that she was fully aware of what was causing her husband's terminal illness. The fact that she performs the circumcision is evidence that Moses was incapacitated. So he's dying. He's unable to do this. So she performs the act, accuses him of being a husband of blood twice because of circumcision. So she obviously was not into circumcising their kids. And she was a stumbling block to the greater work that God was about to do through Moses. And her resistance imperiled Moses' life. Now it's significant that after performing the sacred act and saving Moses' life, Zipporah disappears from the narrative. She's nowhere to be found from this point on until chapter 18 after they're safely out of Egypt, where it says she had been sent away and she's brought back to him after the exodus. So she, she has no part in it, in other words. She too misses out. But Moses learns the seriousness of representing God properly before the children of Israel. It's been said that the words of a leader are like a nail that is fastened in place for others to follow by hanging on to it. But the leader's personal example, that is the hammer that, that fastens the nail into place. If that example doesn't follow you know, the nail of his words, everything and everyone hanging on to it falls down. And that's how it would be with Moses. If he were to tell the children of Israel, you have to be circumcised, as a sign of being God's chosen people, while his own children weren't, he would be, you know, destroying the whole nation just through his own actions. It carries a lot of weight. Be not many teachers. James 3 1 says, knowing you will receive stricter judgment. Something made totally clear here. Now, the narrative has more of a natural break here, so we're picking up at chapter 27 next time. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that we can go through it the way that we do, just systematically walking through the word. And now, God, as we gather together to pray, the most important part of our service tonight, God, to gather into groups and pray together, be in one accord, Lord, intercessory prayer for our nation, for this city, for one another. I pray that this time would be, Lord, just a powerful time of prayer and would be strengthening for us and that would be taken seriously god so please bless it god we ask and bless the rest of our evening in jesus name amen let's stand we'll have a final song and then we'll have prayer
to die Oh, when I come to die Give me Jesus Give me Jesus Give me Jesus satisfaction there is Lord <laughs> and we can't wait we can't wait to be with you Father and uh, Lord we just pray you would be with us tonight as we pray with each other Lord just uh, pray through us by your Holy Spirit give us the words Lord God that you want us to uh, lift each other up with Father just thank you please bless your word to us Father God please help it to be um, just that you would be speaking to us about what you had to say to us throughout the rest of this week. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and pray with one another. We bow our hearts. We lift our